It's time for episode number 235 with my friend Julie Allen, the founder of Mary Rose Northwest Boutique and also the Mary Rose Foundation, just in time for Giving Tuesday. Let's talk about your business strategy and the juicy details of what actually works from mainstream fashion to fashion on Main Street and the entire ecosystem behind it. How do we scale your company and do it with the balance and the happiness that we all seek? Let's hear from those insiders, experts, and strategists that actually make it happen. I'm your host, Ashley Alderson from the Boutique Hub, and I can't wait to chat. Hey guys, I hope you are surviving the chaos of Black Friday weekend. Today, as we drop the podcast, I'm so excited that you're here to listen because it's an important day. It's Giving Tuesday. I know that so many of you and so many consumers are well aware of Black Friday and Small Business Saturday and Cyber Monday, but what maybe not as many people are aware of is Giving Tuesday and the importance of Giving Tuesday, the day when after all of the hustle and bustle and the sales and just the commerce that happens is a day where so many retailers give back. And so it's so fitting that today on the show, we are joined by my friend Julie Allen, a longtime member of the Boutique Hub and Retail Boot Camp and so many programs we do at the Hub, is here to talk about something very special to her mission and to her why, and I think a story that so many of you are going to be able to relate to. Oftentimes, we start our businesses because there's a greater mission that we want to impact in the world around us. There is a legacy we want to leave. There's a cause that we want to champion. And Julie's story is just that. She wants to spread a very positive message with the community around her and also change lives in the process. So if that sounds like you and you've ever wondered how to start a foundation or how to just give back more in your own business, Julie is going to tell you exactly how she did it today on the show. Guys, welcome my friend Julie, the founder of Mary Rose Northwest Boutique out of Oregon and also the Mary Rose Foundation. Hey guys, this week I'm so excited to cover a topic that I think is essential for business owners to know about today and really it kind of goes back to the reason we're all in business in the first place and that is how important it is to have a why associated with your business. So Julie Allen is joining me today from Mary Rose Northwest Boutique. Hello, Julie. Hi, Ashley. I'm so pumped that you're on today. Oh my gosh, me too. I could not wait, really. I was very excited. This is going to be such a good conversation. And you and I have messaged each other about this for a while. Yes. Just how important it is to have a bigger why behind your business. And I know even though your business is new, this has definitely helped you spread your message, not only your business's message, but your bigger why, which we'll cover. And it's helped you because you were also the runner up Mm -hmm. storefront boutique of the year in Oregon this year, and also a runner up for overall boutique of the year in the state of Oregon, which is amazing. So congratulations. Thank you very much. It's quite the honor. So talk to me about in true boutique chat podcast fashion about how the business first came to be Mm -hmm. and about your background um, coming into retail. So I started the boutique right about a year and a half ago. So when I say we're a baby business, we really are a baby business still. So I had uh, my first son, he's two and a half now. So I had him well two and a half years ago. And about a year into motherhood, I decided that I could not stay at home anymore. My previous career was in physical therapy. So I'm a physical therapist by trade. And I did not want to go back to the healthcare field. It wasn't sitting right with me anymore, right? There's a lot to healthcare that I just, I just didn't really want to be involved in that career anymore. Mm -hmm. I had an idea and I told my husband, okay, I'd like to open a women's clothing boutique. And he said, you're crazy. I said, I've heard that before, but he let me, or well, we talked about it more. So I opened online only a year and a half ago. So two clothing racks in my bonus room. And it was very, very small, but about six months into the business, we opened our nonprofit and then another few months went by and we opened our storefront and we've been in our storefront for almost a year now and things are just continuing to grow and grow. And it's been really fun to learn business and learn marketing and all that stuff. It's quite the change from healthcare, which is really quite refreshing. Man, well, how cool that you get to combine a couple of your passions basically into three different businesses, right? Your online business, storefront business, yes, and then the foundation. And I know setting up a foundation is no easy feat. That is definitely a process in itself to go through. It is. I was 
honestly not quite prepared for the process for setting up a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to it. I am so thankful for the board. I have a wonderful board of directors and my husband honestly has done a lot on the back end of setting it up because that's naturally not my strength. Like I'm the idea person, right? I come up with these fantastic, crazy ideas, but I've had a lot of support in actually getting all the T's crossed and I's dotted. So that's been great. Absolutely. The dreamer and the the integrator, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. (laughs) So I know your foundation, obviously you created it because it's something very personal to you, but also now impacts so many women across the state, right? Mm -hmm. Not just in your local community. Correct. So give me some backstory. I know there may be some people listening that have had a battle similar to yours. So I'd love to hear Mm -hmm. kind of the story of why this foundation and how it came to be. So our foundation is the Mary Rose Foundation, and we work to help fund treatment for people suffering with eating disorders. So I personally had an eating disorder, anorexia and bulimia for about 15 years growing up. So I was, you know, before I was a teenager is when it all started. And then it persisted into my early mid 20s. I spent my entire high school years just in and out of the hospital, in and out of different treatment centers, different therapists, different nutritionists. And it was honestly the hardest thing I've ever had to do is getting better, even though that's kind of a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. But the last time I was in treatment, I had to go to a residential treatment center. And I actually went to one up in Canada because the ones in the US were so expensive. Like I was in and out of treatment for 15 years, right? My parents, they had to take out a second mortgage on their house in order to pay for my treatment. And I needed treatment. Like I was going to die. I mean, it was medical hospitalizations and medical. And Insurance doesn't cover it that much. Mm -hmm. And what they do cover is is not enough. The access to treatment is so limited. I recognize that need. And, you know, now being able to give back to that community Mm -hmm. is something that it just fills my cup every single Mm -hmm. day. Like when I was a kid, I always thought like, okay, someday I'm going to pay my parents back. Mm -hmm. You know, I always had that in the back of my head. I recognized all the risk that they took financially for me to go to treatment And I thought, okay, I'm going to pay them back someday. And I had no idea that it would turn into this much paying it forward. Mm -hmm. Julie, I can't imagine. I mean, 15 years. And, you know, I think what frustrates me, you and I were talking about this before we started to record. I had a niece that battled Mm -hmm. anorexia for a number of years. And I lived with my sister and my niece while this was going on. And and I had dealt with cancer, right? And that's something that people openly talk about. Mm-hmm. But eating disorders are, are something that people do not talk about. Right. And it is such an injustice what's happening Correct. with insurance. And granted, this is off topic for the whole podcast, but like you're, you're not cared for in the way that another disorder or disease should and could be. Correct. The amount of people that actually go to treatment is not that much. Mm -hmm. Like anorexia has the highest mortality rate of all mental illness. And a huge portion of those are from suicide. So it's very clear that this population really needs serving. Mm -hmm. There aren't really, there's like, I think there's one other nonprofit that does what we're doing. But there's hardly any resources available Mm -hmm. for people that need this life-saving treatment. Man, I'm so glad that you created the foundation that you did. I was telling you too, my sister, her husband's company ended up funding my niece's treatment because basically they kick you out of Mm -hmm. your residential treatment before you're well, because you're definitely not well, but the insurance runs out and you're left to sink or swim. Yep. And more than likely, you're going to sink because it takes a very long time to get in recovery. It's a really difficult illness to battle. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame that the insurance companies just kick you out. And I saw it happen so many times, too. Yeah. So was there a turning point for you, like where you felt like you kind of rounded the corner in your battle that kind of got you to the later point in your life where you decided you did want to give back in this way? For sure. Yeah. The last time I went to treatment, like I said, I went to a residential in Canada and I was at this point in my early 20s. Right. And so most of the other times I had been in treatment, I was a minor. It was one of those. I don't want to get better. Screw you. I'm not going to do what you say. But by the time I actually decided for myself that, Mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, I need to do something different or I am going to die. That was the point which I was finally able to start working on myself. It's a huge, long, long journey, but it's definitely possible. Like recovery is totally possible. I never thought I would be where I am today. And it's slow too. Like I still have days where I'm like, I don't even want to look in the mirror. Right. But 
it's a process and it's a huge part of our culture too. Honestly, women in general are really, really hard on themselves Mm -hmm. and are not easily allowed to say that they feel beautiful. So that's another thing that we're working on changing. Like I want all women, all people to know that they are gorgeous and they deserve to feel that way. I love that. You had mentioned that you have a saying in your business, and that is that there's no crying in the fitting room. Could you talk to me more about that? Yeah. Yeah. How many times? Well, you don't have to answer this, but (laughs) I feel like everybody has gone into the fitting room Mm -hmm. and cried. Yes. We all have those days where it's like nothing fits right. And no matter what you put on, everything looks wrong, right? And so we focus in the boutique a lot on that personalized, I call our um, sales associate stylist, right? Like they are our stylist, they're personal stylists for our clients that come in. And so if they're trying on something in the fitting room, we want them to come out, we encourage them to come out and talk to us about the fit. Like if they don't like it, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just not the right piece of clothing for you. So then we'll try again, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's not you, it's the clothes. And we'll try again. And also one of my favorite parts about our shop is, I call it our affirmation mirror. So it's just a huge mirror, right? That you come out of the fitting room and then you see people have written on it and just these dry erase markers, like you're beautiful, you're worthy, like love yourself. And just like you can write, anyone can write on the mirror. Oftentimes Mm -hmm. my... My kids will come in and draw all over in the mirror. You know, that's cute too. But it's just one of the most encouraging, uplifting things that we have is because we're all hard on ourselves. And it's nice to see like women surrounding other women and lifting each other up. Oh, I absolutely love that idea. It seems like women today are so at war with their own bodies. Mm -hmm. And I know that this is the foundation of the business that you've built that we all deserve to be served and loved and, you know, help Mm -hmm. finding things that fit our body. And this is why boutiques work in a world where big box stores are failing because we can do that one thing that nobody else can do. Right. Definitely. Yeah. It's that, you know, our girls know that whenever somebody comes in the door, like the number one thing, like make them feel welcome. Mm -hmm. They need to feel welcomed and loved and supported. Like whatever it is that that person needs, we are there to serve them. And I am so fortunate to have such a wonderful staff that has really gotten behind me and the and the mission just to help women, you know, empower women, help women feel good about themselves and know that they deserve to feel good about themselves. Because mm-hmm. also like, you know, as a mom, I think we can often put ourselves last most of the time. And it's, that's just something where, um, we're fighting against. Absolutely. Yeah. So talk to me more about Mm -hmm. starting the actual foundation and how that went along with the boutique. How did you, I know, you know, we talked about the process for creating a 501c3 is, it's kind of a nightmare. (laughs) Kind of a pain. Yeah. (laughs) But you survived, right? Yep. How how was the foundation set up in terms of how do you raise Mm -hmm. money every year? What's your biggest event or uh, what have you created that helps to give back? And then how are you celebrating that and spreading that with the community that you're wanting to impact? Yeah, so our foundation does two pretty large fundraising events a year. We do a, a smaller spring event, which last year was like a personalized photo shoot for women that came in. And it was like a mommy and me kind of photo shoot, right? We had makeup artists and it was like makeovers and stuff. You should probably cut that part out. That was not very good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, edit right there. Uh, let me ask you the question <laughs> again, and then you can rephrase that, okay? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so talk to me about the foundation. I know creating the 501c3 can be uh, a nightmare in itself, but you survive that part. Yes. Talk to me, how do you raise money for the foundation? And then yes. how is it physically tied in with your business? How do you market the two of them together? Okay. So we do a couple large fundraising events a year, and we actually just had our second annual Mary Rose Foundation Gala this Saturday. So I'm still like recovering from that. But that was a, it was a large gala. Like we raised about double the funds we raised last year, which was very, very exciting. And so what we do for that gala is we have dinner, we have drinks, we have silent auctions, which our board members go around and collect silent auction items from our local community. And then we do this really kicking fashion show with women of all shapes, all sizes, all colors, all ages. And that's just, it is such a fun uplift 
uplifting event. It's very empowering. Mm -hmm. We had a really great keynote speaker that just talked about like her speech was called The Price of Perfect. And she just talked about um, like you can strive to be quote unquote Mm. perfect, but the cost is going to be you. And so, yeah, that's how we raise money for that event, the silent auctions. And then I also donate a very large portion of the boutique sales that we do that night to the foundation. Mm. But day to day, how we fund the foundation is through the boutique. So the boutique, a portion of all sales that we do through our shop are donated straight to the foundation. So that's how we're funding it all year round, in addition to our events that we put on. That's amazing. And then, you know, do you, just listening to you speak, do you feel like through the foundation and through your Facebook group or just like your ongoing marketing with the boutique, do you feel like Mm -hmm. that that's really given a voice to people that have battled eating disorders? Like I said, in a time when it's just not spoken about, Mm -hmm. really no mental illness is really spoken about today, like other physical illnesses, let's say. Yeah. One thing I've tried really, really hard to do is break down that stigma of mental health in general, specifically eating disorders, Mm -hmm. just because that's what I personally struggled with. But our community that we have created, our community around Mary Rose is all about women empowering women, knocking off that stigma of asking for help, mental health, eating disorders. Like It's so important for us to talk about because I think that there's still shame around it. And there's still like shame in saying, I'm not okay, or I I need help. And so I'm trying really hard to break that down. And I think people can look at, you know, they'll look at my life and say, okay, she, you know, she has it all together. You know, I'm married, I have a family, I have this boutique and I have a nonprofit. But guess what, there are still some days where I have to fight to get out of bed. I have to fight because I have OCD. And so it's still a fight for me to put one foot in front of the other and keep going on some days. And I really Mm -hmm. I want to normalize that. And I want women to know that no matter what you're going through, you're not alone. And that's kind of been the whole message behind Mary Rose is that no matter what, Mm -hmm. who you are, what you're going through, you're not alone and you deserve to love yourself. Oh, I love that, Julie. Thanks. If there's anyone listening who has, you know, daughters that are teenagers or daughters that are pre-teenagers, mm-hmm. having been through what you've been through, what advice would you give to mothers on how they could help, um, you know, some of that teenage junk mm-hmm. that we're all bound to face? Do you have any any advice for moms that are listening? Yeah, the it's so hard. The biggest thing you can do as a mom is to love yourself. And to model that self-love and taking care of yourself is important. We, as a whole, need to put ourselves back on our priority list, right? And it's really hard to do. As a mom and a business owner and a wife, it's like somebody always needs something, right? But you know what? Sometimes I need something too. And that is, that's really important for us to know that we deserve to be on our priority list. And then just modeling that for our kids. Um, My stepdaughter is eight and she actually got to go to the gala this year. And that meant so much to me to, because she got to see all these different women rocking the runway, like the runway. It was so freaking cool. It is. Oh, it was just, it was amazing, actually. And like having Addison witness that was just awesome, you know? And so she's, she's seeing me love myself even on, And like, we never use the word fat in our house. We never, you know, we're very like clear, not clear, excuse me. We're very careful on what language we use around her. Um, But it's really hard. Like the pressures that our young daughters um, are facing is honestly terrifying. Addison's only eight and it's like, Mm -hmm. what's these next, what are these next five years going to bring? I don't know. Yeah. Even at eight, I feel like it starts and I have a nine-year-old it does. and yeah. going to gym class and having to change shirts with other girls, yeah. they, she came home with, with the F word, right? Yeah. Yep. Addison's, Not okay yep. in our house either for the, for the same reason, right? Yeah. But boy, I don't know where they hear that, but they, they pick it up so quick. You've got to be so on guard. Yeah. It's terrifying. Honestly, the, the best thing that I can say is just 
love yourself and make sure that your daughters and sons know that it's okay to love yourself. Cause that's, I mean, that, that's as much as we can do really, you know, we can't control school. We can't control what their friends are telling them, but we can control what they hear at home and hopefully get enough positive love into them that hopefully they can deflect mm -hmm. um, some of those negative messages. But I hear you. It's, it's terrifying. How do you model? Terrifying. How do you model as a mom who has, you know, like I said, basically three businesses, right, that you're operating? Mm -hmm. How do you model taking care of yourself or, you know, finding that word balance amongst the chaos of it all? I First of all, I don't like that word. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Kind of annoying, actually. <laughs> First of all, I love being busy. I honestly thrive under this multiple hat kind of thing that I'm doing. But I also am very good at scheduling. My schedule is, you know, dialed in like Wednesdays are family day. My husband um, is a police officer. And so his schedule is all all messed mm -hmm. up and he's on call half the week and is working nights and whatever. So our schedules are just chaos. But like scheduling time for myself, like I schedule in a workout every day. I schedule in a walk. I'll schedule in um, one time this last summer, not one time, more than one time. I scheduled in laying in the sun. I, like, I put that on my calendar. I got to do it. <laughs> so scheduling has been my lifesaver and delegating. I'm reading the book um, Clockwork right now because I saw Mike speak at Summit and loved him, by the way, also doing process so good. first, but now reading Clockwork and it was like, delegate. Oh, I don't have to do everything. It's like, I don't do a lot of the doing work anymore. I'm doing a lot more on the designing work, but not a ton of the doing anymore. That's so, a, anyway, scheduling is my answer. That's a big, I, I, we've got to talk about this more because of all yeah. the books I've read in 2019, yeah. I think Clockwork probably my favorite. I love it. So if you're listening and you haven't heard it yet, Mike Michalowicz wrote Profit First, which a lot of people in our community have read and implemented. And of course he spoke at Summit, but Clockwork, man, it's all about the queen bee role, right? Mm -hmm. And yep. And that's like, so I, you know, figured out what our queen bee role was and that's what I've not pushed on our stylist, but made sure that they all know what the number one priority is. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling it works great. He's on to something with that book. That's a very good book. It's such a good book. I think that yeah. I'm going to just really nerd out here because I just love this conversation. But yeah. I think that's the number one struggle I see with business owners today, whether they're new or experienced, is yeah. we all are a bunch of walking control freaks. Uh-huh. A little bit. And we think nobody can do it as good as we can. Yeah. And we're the ones with the vision. I know. And the truth is we just need to get out of our own way. The yes. only way to grow a business is to understand processes and procedures mm -hmm. and to train people for whatever your queen bee role is. And it's not that you're the queen bee. Mm -mm. Like you're, you, you don't have to be the queen bees, but there's a queen bee role. And that is the, the most important role to serve your customer. Right. And then just just let go of the reins for a second, train your people, yeah. delegate. Yeah, it's been the most freeing thing. Now I have someone else doing everything that was taking up all my time. Oh, now I can actually, you know, work on my, I, I'm looking for a director of fundraising now for the foundation. And it's freed me up to be able to do all the big things, which is really the number one reason we're in business is to do the big things mm -hmm. and design our futures. Absolutely. Would you say mm -hmm. along the way, you know, the process of self-discovery of being a business owner, right? Mm -hmm. um, would you say that one of the biggest obstacles you faced has been fear, like the fear of letting go or what's been your biggest challenge so far um, in business? Yeah. I want to kind of back up just to skosh. Like, so fear used to dominate all of my life. I was afraid of everything. I remember being in therapy when I was like, I don't know, 18, 19 years old. And my therapist asked me, she goes, what are you, what are you afraid of? And I was like, well, let me tell you. And I just listed literally everything you could think of, right? So the, the last time I was in treatment 10 years ago, I started implementing doing one thing every day that scared me. Just one thing. And at first it was the smallest of things like, okay, I ate a bite of, I ate a bite of food and didn't flip out or it didn't like immediately do whatever behaviors I was doing at that time. So I started doing one thing every day that scared me. So by the time I got to this point in my life, I can honestly say I'm really not afraid to try. I'm not afraid of failing because, you know, I don't have anything to lose. And I've built that quote bravery muscle over the last 10 years, because like, what do you have to lose if you, if it doesn't work? 
try again or try something else. But not letting fear hold me back has been really good. Because my husband, he biggest supporter of me, but he thinks I'm nuts half the time. He's like, you want to do what? You want to open what? You want to do this? Okay, okay, you're crazy, but I'll support you. But it's because I've built my bravery muscle over the last 10 years. So it's doing one thing every day that scares you is really one of my favorite things to say. I love that you call it the bravery muscle. I think that makes so much sense. I just Uh was visiting with my friend Marie Earthman um, on the podcast Mm -hmm. and she was talking about, actually we were having a whole conversation about mental health and she was saying how part of her journey, similar to yours, was that in therapy, Mm -hmm. she had to go through all of her biggest fears and then she literally had to like be in that moment and then walk through, okay, what do you do in that moment? Do you think that, you know, so many business owners are scared of, like the fear of failure is so alive for entrepreneurs. So, you know, what lesson is there for boutique owners that are listening? Do you think it's important for them to face the fear of walking through, hey, here's my plan A and plan B. If things don't go quote unquote as planned, what's my next step so that you can flex the bravery muscle and get through that possible scenario? Oh, totally. Yeah. And things never go as planned in a perfect world. Like, okay, sure. Maybe I planned X, Y, and Z and maybe it actually went X, Y, and Z, but that's not the reality. It's a lot of flexing that flexing that bravery muscle. That's the perfect way to say that. But it's important to do. Let's talk about things that also work well in business. Uh-huh. I know that one thing that works well for you is obviously the queen bee role, and that's speaking to your customers. You know, with such strong affirmation. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to me about you know kind of marketing strategies that have worked for you. And how you've also shared that message across social media so that your customer truly does understand your why Mm -hmm. and feels connected to you and your mission. Yeah. So everything that we do on social media is tied back to our mission, right? And our mission is let's help every single woman know that they are beautiful and know that they deserve to feel that way. So that that's our mission. And so um, every post that we do, every... Instagram story or whatever that we're doing somehow is tied back to that. And so just flooding that message in all of our content that we're putting out there is really how that we've been successful. Um, And also like not playing up the foundation, but making sure that people know that, hey, we have a foundation and every single purchase that comes through a portion of that's donated straight to the foundation. And so it's just like making that message consistent and making it well known, right? Like if you go onto our Facebook group, like you'll see just a lot of encouraging things from, you know, all of our staff, real honest posts and that are encouraging. Mm -hmm. So just making it consistent. I was looking at your Facebook page um, a while ago and I was noticing that you do have such great engagement. I know your group has got great engagement too. And I'm assuming because Mm -hmm. you've got such, you know, that, that old saying about it's better to have, you know, a hundred true fans than a thousand followers. And that's truly what you've built already in your business. Yeah, no, we, we do not have a huge following by any means. Like our Facebook group is under 3000. We're not big, whatever. Um, we're a small fry, but like our engagement is amazing. The interaction we have, like these women really, they are our friends. They know us online and then they'll come into the shop and we hug half of them, right? Because we know them. Like our whole staff is really, really does a great job of Mm -hmm. engaging in the Facebook group and just making everybody feel welcomed and loved, which goes back to what our queen Mm -hmm. bee role is. So one other thing that I noticed you do really well, and I'm going to put you on the spot here, is I love your photos. Well, thank you. Your photos in your store are so simple and so just clean and consistent. And I know that that in the boutique hub anyway, that's a question we get all the time is product photography and, you know, it's blah and I need to do more flat lays. But yeah. Talk me through your photos because they do look great. Thank you. I love our photographer. Love, love, love her. So I used to do all my own photos, right? But then I was listening to Sarah, you know, Sarah, <laughs> and she was like, do what you do best and hire the rest. So I, you know, go like, okay, well, I'm going to hire a photographer because I don't take photos. And so I found this amazing photographer who, first of all, like she lines up perfectly with our mission. Like it's the exact same as hers, right? She is a feminine badass photographer. And I just 
adore her. So she having a good photographer is mm-hmm. key. And so we shoot every other weekend, excuse me, every other week, um, new arrivals, and then I upload to the website, but that consistent photographer and we use so models like are the girls from the shop. Um, we use real women, just our stylist mm-hmm. usually and a couple others that like to come in and model for us but it's all very simple and consistent and you're in a lot of the photos as well do you find that your customers react well when you're a part of the photography oh hands down yeah definitely they love that so tori tori is our manager and she's been with us i don't know april march or april and so she's really you know, I am not physically in the shop that much. Tori is in the shop. And so having her be a part of the photo shoots has been really, really good for our in-person interactions because a lot of people were like, oh, when are you going to be in the shop? You know, for a couple hours, but not, you know, I spend most of my time at home in sweatpants these days. But having her be a part of the photo shoots has been really, really good too, because then then they also recognize her as a face of the business too, which kind of helps alleviate some of that, not pressure off me, but just me needing to be everywhere at all points in time. Absolutely. Yeah. So kind of a big picture question, and I I just love everyone's viewpoints on this, but talk to me about Mm -hmm. kind of trends in business. I know you say you're a baby business, but that you still are entitled to one heck of an opinion here in terms of where you see the industry going. What do you like about what's happening now, but what do you wish could evolve in our boutique retail industry? Mm, I want to see more personal relationships with vendors. I don't know if I can say this. Uh, (laughs) I'm tired of seeing like cheaply made things and the same thing over and over. Um, So I really think that the industry as a whole is going to start going a little bit more towards uh, specialized pieces and specialized like areas and just better relationships with the vendors and the designers because I love having good relationships with our vendors. I nicknamed one of mine Sparkle Shoes because she has these gorgeous Kate Spade Sparkle Shoes because she's just a lovely person. I love that. I I think that, (laughs) man, you know, in such a... This is a whole nother topic. Okay. Boutiques and wholesale vendors live very similar lives, although they don't always see it. You know, retail has gone so omni-channel. You've got to be online, but also in person. Uh And wholesale, you know, used to be so in person, but then really made a shift for online. Uh But I think what you're saying is so spot on. You have to have a great mix of both. You have to have online availability, right? And instant access. Mm -hmm. But you have to have the personalization in wholesale, just like you do in retail. Yes, for sure. Yeah, it's my, I, I love going to the market, meeting with vendors that I work with. I love doing that because it's it's nice to have that personal connection with vendors. It really, really is. It makes it so much better than ordering who knows what off of other websites, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Are you ready for some lightning round questions? Bring it on. <laughs> So eager. <laughs> I'm not scared. <laughs> You're so eager. Okay. Um, who who's your mentor? You know, you okay. This is kind of maybe a little bit embarrassing, but I kind of have a little bit of a girl crush on Sarah. You know, you're Sarah. Um, I, <laughs> yes, you're Sarah. Sarah. You're worse, in case do, you do, sorry. <laughs> um, I think she first of all, she's just gorgeous. Like she's just the kind of I, I look up to her a lot and you too, but I really, really, um, I love what Sarah has to say about stuff. Like I like how honest she is about her mm-hmm. past with the retail you know, stuff and like, okay, well, this is what I did wrong and this is how you fix it. And I have learned a lot from listening to her specifically in retail boot camp. I have learned a lot and implemented a lot too. And we are doing much better financially now because of everything that I've implemented from what I've learned from Sarah. That is so sweet. She's going to love hearing that. <laughs> Her and I were speaking this morning and we were planning, we've got a trip coming up where we've got to give a presentation together. So we were writing uh-huh. our, our notes or slide notes, whatever we're going to talk about. And she, we're talking and she just like whips out this random analogy about business being like a flat tire and she goes on with it. And I'm uh-huh. like, Sarah, I just started laughing. I said, where do you even come up with these analogies? Like everything is so off the cuff. And she's like, Ashley, it's just like when you come up with Will Ferrell quotes, like the stuff just rolls off your tongue and you don't know. Her gift is far better than mine, but the girl is very Well, Farrell's pretty amazing too. So <laughs> don't cut yourself short. That's pretty awesome. Well, I think that's a good one. So if anyone doesn't know Sarah Burks, definitely have to give her a holler inside of the boutique hub. She has taught me a lot. I 
I remember we I was in Vegas for the first time, like two magics ago, right? And I was in your little, I was brand new in the boutique hub. And we were in the the breakfast thing that you guys did. And you guys were talking about the open to buy plan. And I raised my hand and I'm like, okay, what's an open to buy plan and how do I get one? And that's the first interaction I had with Sarah. I don't know if she'd remember that, but I liked her immediately after that. I think she probably nerded out on the topic. That stuff. She kind of did a little little over my head at that point in time, but that's okay. I get it now. So perfect. All right. Uh, favorite book? Oh, Clockwork, because I'm currently reading it and kind of obsessed with it. Perfect. Yeah. Favorite podcast? Well, I have to say this one. Oh, you win. And it really is. This, I, you know, it really is. Like, it's what I listen to in the car when my two-year-old's not perfect. screaming. Perfect. Um, favorite quote? Courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. Oh. Nelson Mandela. That's, that yeah. is beautiful. That's a good one. Thank you. Favorite trend at the moment? Uh, cheetah. Every woman's favorite. Everything animal print. Cheetah. I love cheetah so much. Is there a trend you wish would die? <sighs> mom jeans. What? I'm I sorry. love mama jeans. They double as the, a bra. They, I know. I just, I, I'm a mom and I just like, <laughs> they don't do anything for the butt. And I lo- like, <laughs> I'm all like, you got to <laughs> accentuate the booty and like sometimes the mom jeans don't work with the booty. Um, I was walking, not I was literally walking <laughs> out to the car today wearing mom jeans and combat boots. Yeah. Mom jeans. And That's com- amazing. Yeah. Actually. I, I mean, you only live once. With cheetah, I hope. Oh, you know yeah. what? I, no cheetah Any today. Cheetah? No cheetah today. No. Okay. Black okay. and white, okay. graphic tee, mom jeans, combat boots. And Eric's in the car because we're going to go to lunch <laughs> together because it's one of our team members' birthdays. Yeah. And I can see him. He put his hand on his mouth and then just started shaking uh-huh. his head. Like, no, no, <laughs> this is not, this is not happening. Yeah, right no, and it's the butt That's and awesome. it's the combat boots. He's just not, not a fan. I, yeah, I know. I, I totally get there's a place for mom jeans. Like I love high waisted jeans, but not like so high waisted that they're a bra. Is that fair? It's fair. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> what's your greatest piece of advice uh, for someone who is listening how they could go grow their business. Find your message and say your message over and over in as many ways as you can. Really focus on building that community around your brand and attracting those 100 super fans because those 100 super fans are awesome and they really will stand behind you and support you. I love that. That's great advice. Thanks. Well, Julie, you you know the last question, right? Because you listen to the I podcast do. and and Really, the last question has so much to do with our topic today. So before I ask it, I just really want to affirm you and tell you thank you. And that I know you had such a battle in your own life, but your battle doesn't go unnoticed. And it's beautiful the way that you've been able to take that and impact so many other you know, men and women's lives because of it. So thank you for coming on the show today and sharing that with our entire community. That definitely means a lot. Thank you. I really, that, I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. You're very welcome. Well, uh, yeah. in last question fashion, um, when you are a, an, an elderly grandma and mm-hmm. you are on the front porch with those sweet grandbabies and you're talking about the life that you lived and the business that you created, what is the legacy that you hope you leave behind and the thing that they will say about you at that point? So really, I love this question. I want them to say that I was compassionate and inspiring. I want people to just my my love for other people and my hope of empowering um, empowering women. I think that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Julie. Again, it means a ton that you came on the show today to share this message. And I can't wait to see where you continue to grow in the future. Thank you. Isn't Julie's story amazing? Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. I hope this hit home for you and gave you some insight on how you can give back more in your own community, with your own cause, and with your business. You know, this is the perfect time I wanted to close today by mentioning that this is a cause very important to the Boutique Hub. And if you've heard much of our story about how the Hub got started, I've always felt like 
The hub was an opportunity for Eric and I and for our entire family to give back on a much greater level, right? To offer um, a ministry to people, a service to people, a voice to people, um, but also to hear what you're interested in supporting yourself and offer a tool to be charitable in the process. So as many of you know, our Boutique Boss store, a part of the hub that has all of our Boutique Boss merchandise, all proceeds of that store go to charity as voted on by our entire membership. And since we last voted, we have all been in agreement that we're going to continue to support an operation very near and dear to us called Operation Underground Railroad. Now, this is a team of ex-Navy SEALs who have left their post to rescue victims of human trafficking, but also to work with law enforcement to arrest their perpetrators. They've partnered with people like Tony Robbins and Russell Brunson and a lot of big names in business in the United United States. They cross international borders and they do a lot of work that frankly the government isn't always able to do on their own. So in case you want to join us in our mission to fight human trafficking, honestly as a mother probably my biggest nightmare, I can't imagine, uh, then please support the Boutique Boss Store. It's the theboutiquebossstore.com. This includes the Boutique Boss Planner. If you've had an opportunity to purchase a 2020 Boutique Boss Planner, the only planner on the market for boutique owners, all of these products, they're proceeds go to Operation Underground Railroad so that together as boutique owners and as an industry, we can make a difference. Guys, thank you for listening to the show and thank you for giving back to the missions and the charities that you feel so strongly about. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. We hope that you loved it. Don't forget to hit subscribe and leave a rating and review down below for a chance to be one of our featured listeners each and every week. For more information on our spirit of community over competition and how to access complete show notes and bonus downloads from our guests, head on over to theboutiquehub.com and join the community. We'll see you next week. 